Hello and welcome back to Linode. In today's video, we are going to go over the concept of object storage. Object storage is a feature of Linode that lets you store, well, objects. But more specifically, it gives you a way of adding additional storage capability to your Linodes and your apps. And you could use it to store anything from ISO images, pictures, website files, backups, or even important application files for your apps. So let's go ahead and dive into object storage and see how it works. Object storage is a great technology to use to store objects. And objects in this context are files. So if you have any files that you would like to store, you know, like ISO images, backup files, video files, whatever you may have, object storage is a great way of doing that. So by default, object storage is not enabled on new accounts. So if you want to use this feature, you will need to turn it on. If you do enable object storage on your account, just keep in mind that there will be at least a $5 minimum fee to have this service on your account. And the billing starts immediately regardless of how you enable it. There's two different methods, which I'll get into in a moment. But just keep in mind that you do need to pay a minimum of $5 a month to have this feature enabled. Now there's two ways that you can enable object storage. The first way, you could create a key pair for object storage, or you can create a bucket. A bucket is essentially where files go in object storage. I'll show you how the feature works in just a moment, but essentially what you do is you create a bucket and then you're able to store files inside that bucket. And if you do create a bucket, then that's the second way that you enable object storage on your account. If you create a bucket, then the feature is turned on immediately. Now it doesn't matter how you enable object storage on your account. Either way, you do need to create a bucket. Just keep that in mind. So first of all, I'm going to walk you guys through the process of creating a key pair for object storage. So let's go ahead and get started. So here on the left, we have a link to object storage. So I'll click on that. And then we have two tabs, one for buckets and then the other for access keys. So I'll create an access key. That's pretty easy. We just click the create an access key button right here. We should give it a label. So you could call it whatever you'd like. I'll just call mine bucket access key, simple enough. Click submit. And then you'll see this message right here that's telling you basically what I've already mentioned that there's going to be at least a flat rate of $5 a month to have this service on your account. And what you get with that is 250 gigabytes of storage. Then you get one terabyte of outbound data transfer. And then beyond that, it's two cents per gigabyte per month. So if that's okay with you, then you click Enable Object Storage. And now it looks like the key is generating. And there it is. Now as it says here, it's only going to display your secret key once. So what you'll want to do is just save this in a safe place because you won't be able to get this back if you click OK and then you don't get a chance to jot this down. Now notice that the verbiage, be sure to keep it in a safe place, is bolded. And that's just showing you how important this is because if someone gets a hold of the secret key, they could start interacting with your object storage on your account and you definitely don't want that. So I'll click OK. And we now have the feature on our account. We also have a bucket access key that we can use to interact with object storage. And then here it's telling us that we are currently being billed for object storage, but we don't have any buckets. If you don't have any buckets on your account, you can't use this service. So since we're paying for it, well, we may as well make use of it. And to do that, we go here to the bucket section and we can add a new bucket. So I'll add a bucket. And then here we need to first give it a label. For the label field, we are choosing what to call our bucket. And we definitely want to give it a label that is descriptive for its purpose. But unlike other label fields, this actually has to be unique for the entire cluster. Now I'll explain what I mean by cluster in just a moment. So what I'm going to do is just call mine Linode example bucket. And I'll give us some numbers here to ensure that it's unique. Maybe that'll be good enough. For the region, I'll drop that down. And we could choose which of these three regions that we want to create the bucket in. So I'll create mine in New Jersey. And actually, I'll bring that back up because when I talked about clusters earlier, this is what I was referring to. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, we have three here. There might be more or a different number by the time you're seeing this. But the name essentially has to be unique per cluster. So if we have this name right here in the New Jersey cluster, 
then that means that anyone else that's creating a bucket in that same region will not be able to use that name. And if that name already exists in that region, when I finish this process and go to finalize this, then I won't be able to use that. But if the name doesn't exist in Frankfurt or Singapore, then I'll be able to use it there because it has to be unique by the cluster. And that's what I was referring to right here. These three regions are their own clusters. So let's see if the name is taken. I'll click Submit. And what do you know? The name was available, so it let me choose it. And now we have this bucket on my account that I can use to store objects. So now that we have a bucket, we may as well go ahead and use it. So to upload data to the bucket or download from the bucket, we can use the cloud dashboard to do that. Or if you generated an access key like we did earlier in the video, then you'll be able to use the API to do this in your application or via the command line, depending on your use case. So to show you what the process looks like through the cloud dashboard, you simply click on your bucket. Then you can click Browse Files. And I actually have a notes file that I can use as an example. This one right here. I'll open that up. And I was successfully able to add that to my bucket. If you want to remove something from your bucket, you could click on the three dots next to the item you'd like to remove. And then you can go ahead and delete it. You can also download the file if you'd like to pull that back down. Which will then trigger your browser to bring up the save dialog that will allow you to download the file to your computer. As you can see, the process through the dashboard is very, very easy. So next, let's take a look at using the Linode command line tools to interact with your bucket. Now in my case, I'm going to use the terminal on my local laptop to facilitate communicating with the bucket. But the tools are installed via Python pip, so you don't have to be running Linux, but any platform that gives you the ability to use Python pip will enable you to install the required package to interact with the service. In my case, I don't have the tools installed at all. I don't even have pip on this system yet. Now my laptop is running Pop! OS currently, which is built on top of Ubuntu. So what I'm going to do is install the required Ubuntu package that enables me to use pip. But what I'm going to do is run sudo apt install python3 pip, just like that. I'll put in my super secret password. I'll confirm by pressing enter. And there we go. Now so far this process isn't specific to Linode. We're essentially just installing the pip tool for Python. So now we should be able to install the Linode command line tools and then interact with our bucket. So what I'm going to do is run pip3 install linode-cli dash dash upgrade and the dash dash upgrade option is not required. If it's already installed, this will make sure that you have the latest version. Now I don't even have it installed at this point, but the upgrade option shouldn't hurt anything to leave that on here. So I'll press enter. And there we go. I now have the Linode command line tools installed on my local laptop. Now before we can interact with this service, we will need to install another module. This one is not specific to Linode, but it is used by Linode, and it's actually used by other cloud providers as well. It's fairly common, and it's called Botto. So what we'll do is we will run pip3 install Botto, just like that. And you can see that was pretty quick. Now depending on how you have your terminal set up, it may not recognize the Linode CLI command. As you can see here, mine isn't. And that just means that pip is copying Linode CLI to a place that is not in your path. It's beyond the scope of this video to show you how to configure that. So what I'm going to do is paste where that's located on my system, which is this right here. In my case, it's in my home directory. In the .local directory, there's a bin directory, and there we have the Linode CLI binary. To use this service, we will need to create a personal access token. And this is different from the key pair that we've created earlier in the video. We haven't created this yet. So back here on the dashboard, you can click on the name of our account right here. Click on My Profile. Click on API Tokens. So as you can see here, I have a few API tokens that we can use. But what I'll do is create a brand new one so you can see the process. So I'll click here to add a personal access token. And then for the label, I'll just keep it simple. 
I'll just call it bucket API token. For expiry, we can leave that to the default of six months, which means that after six months, this token will be unable to be used. We can actually set it to never if we never want that to expire, or for example, one month if we want to have that expire sooner. Now to interact with this service, what you'll need to do is enable read only for the account. And basically the best rule of thumb is to not enable any permissions that you don't need because if someone gets a hold of this API token, they'll do exactly what you've configured the key to be able to do. Just keep that in mind. But when it comes to object storage, the minimum that we need to configure here is read only for account. And we could do read only if we wanna only be able to download things from the object storage. But what I'm going to do is select read and write. That should be good enough. I'll click create token. Then the token is displayed. And just like it says here, this will never be shown again. So if I click OK without jotting this down, then I'll never be able to get this back. I'll need to create a brand new one. So what I'll do is copy that to the clipboard. And then I'll be able to provide it to the command line tools to allow it to interact with my account. So I'll go back down here to the terminal. Then I'll paste in the token right here. And then Enter. And next, it's going to ask you for the default region. And the bucket that I've created is in US East, so I will choose option six. Now this is the default, you can override this, so just keep that in mind if the region where you created your bucket isn't where you want your default region to be. But anyway, I'll press enter. Then we could choose the default type of Linode. And if I scroll up here, you can see some of the different types. I'm going to choose option number one, that's the Nanode, I'll just have it default to the cheapest option. I can always override that if I would like to create a Linode with a different plan. I'll press enter. Then I could choose the default image. And this is optional, you don't have to select this, but I will. I'll just go ahead with option number 24 for Ubuntu 2004. And there we go. Now we have the command line tools all set up and ready to go. Now nothing that I've done so far is specific to object storage. The questions that came up are just because I haven't yet set up the Linode tools on this machine. But now that I do have the Linode tools all set and ready to go, we can now interact with object storage. And now let's see some examples of using the Linode command line interface to interact with our bucket. So again, we are using the linode-cli command to interact with our account. Next, we're going to type the name of the service that we want to interact with. And of course, it's object storage, which is abbreviated down to OBJ. Then I'll type dash dash help, so we can see some examples, and then I'll press enter. So here we can see some example commands that we can use to interact with a service. For example, del removes a file from the bucket. ls lists buckets or objects. We have put for uploading something to object storage and so on. So let's go ahead and play around with it. So again, we will use the Linode CLI tools. Interact with object storage. And let's try ls. So I'll press enter. And since this is the first time that I'm actually reading data from my account, from the object storage, I need to choose the default cluster. And I created the cluster in US East. I may as well choose that. So one and then enter. And we can see right here that since we ran LS, it is listing the buckets that are in my account. And I only have this one right here, the Linode example bucket that I've created earlier. So we can see that the command line tools are actually working just fine. Now, if I recall that command, I can actually do LA instead of LS, which will list all the objects in all buckets. And we can see that we have inside the Linode example bucket, the notes file that I've created earlier. So I'm going to copy that to the clipboard for the next example. And then what I'm going to do is change the LA to Git. And then I've pasted in the name of the bucket. And then I'll type the name of the object that I want to get. Then I'll press enter. And if I list my storage, I have the notes file right here. And just like you'd probably expect, I can do the reverse and upload something to the bucket as well. So I'll just echo a simple message here to a local file called note2.txt. And there's the contents of the file. So I'll recall the previous command. And I'll change this around a bit. I'll change the git to put, and then the name of the local file, which was note2.txt. 
and then the name of the bucket where I want to upload that file to. And according to this, it looks like that was a success. So back on the dashboard, I'll go ahead and click OK. Again, you definitely want to make sure that you have jotted this down somewhere safe because you'll never see it again. But if I go here to Object Storage, then click on the bucket name, and here on the list we see note2.txt, so that was successfully uploaded. And at this point you have seen examples of using block storage via the Linode dashboard as well as the command line interface, so you should be good to go with all the basics you need to take advantage of this awesome service. So there you go. That was an overview of object storage. I hope that was helpful. As you can see, object storage is awesome. There's many different use cases that you can use it for, but I'll leave it up to you to use your imagination and set it up for your needs. And as always, make sure you click that like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do because we have more awesome content coming very soon. Thanks for watching.